So, Paulette, we just read on the internet like 30 seconds ago that Prince died today. Yeah. It's crazy. I was really hoping to see him play at some point. Yeah, he came to Seattle a couple years ago and played a small show at the Showbox, actually. Oh, yeah, I remember. I really wanted to go, but it was it was out of my price range. Yeah, I almost went uh. because Prince is one of my favorites as a person who grew up in the 80s. And I just, I don't know, I just decided not to go. And then people talked about the concert and how they cried like several mm-hmm. times and he played purple rain and it was like for some people it was like the most amazing show they've ever been to in their life because you know prince he's he's an amazing performer he he can he's got it all I, i've always thought that prince should be held up as the most talented person on the planet because he can't well i'll get into that in a second let me introduce the so, show this is the psychology in seattle podcast i'm your host Dr. Kirk Honda, I'm chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University, Seattle, and I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm Paulette Perhatch, writer and American lay person. We were going to talk about something else today, but then you just read to me that Prince died, and then we confirmed it on the internet. It's so multiple sources from respect to CNN, this kind of stuff. I hope, God, I hope this is not a ruse. This would be terrible. But no, I mean, if it's on... I mean, probably. Let's New York Times it. So the the thing I was saying was is that Prince was is was the most talented person on the planet because he, you know, the things you know about him are true, which is he can sing amazingly, right? And he has this amazing range. He has a huge range as a singer. And my friend, who's a musician, went to see him, and he's just like. He just goes around stage like picking up all the different like he can play like 11 different instruments yeah. just perfectly. Perfectly. He he can sing, he can dance like the Dickens while in platform shoes and buttless buttless pants. Mm. And he can play the guitar almost as well as Jimi Hendrix. He's that good. Mm-hmm. He is amazing on the guitar and he can move in this, you know, sexy gyrating way while he plays guitar in this amazing fashion. People don't realize how amazing of a guitarist he is. He's also an amazing piano player. He has written many songs uh, just for piano that are amazing. He's an amazing drummer. He, he, on, on some of his albums, he played every instrument, including the drums. And he has a very interesting drumming style, actually. I don't know if he taught himself or something, but there's a song tambourine that I love on around the world in a day, but which is incidentally my favorite Prince album around the world in a day. It's the album with raspberry beret and tambourine and this kind of stuff. But anyway, uh, yeah, he can play a lot of other instruments and really well, like he doesn't just sort of dabble. Like I just saw Paul McCartney the other night and he's an amazing musician as well. But, but Prince is just takes it to a whole other level in, in my view. And, and to top it off, Prince is an amazing songwriter, an amazing songwriter. He wrote songs. He wrote many people's best hits, like mm-hmm. Sinead O'Connor's best hit. You know, he, he wrote that song. Uh, I think for um, uh, Shaka Khan, I think he wrote her big hit too. Um, yeah, he's just he was just an amazing guy. Fifty seven years old. We were trying to figure out how he died. It seems like he, we, we don't know yet. He just, mm-hmm. he was found dead essentially, right? Yeah. I, so many people are mourning him and it's like, oh, we don't have Prince now. It's the same thing with Bowie where it's like, we're never going to have another Prince. What's up with 2016? Seriously, 2016 is everyone gather around Mick Jagger and make sure he's okay. <laughs> yeah. And Paul McCartney for that matter. Shit. I mean, George Martin from the Beatles died david bowie alan rickman uh who there there's some other i know there's there's like a whole slew of other people who died this year so uh did you know that prince's real name is prince (laughs) he's the the one guy you would think would have made up his name and his name is also it's surprising uh, this is just going to be a rambling episode because we actually just 30 seconds prior to pressing record discovered he was dead. So I have no notes. And so this is going to be rambly, but 
let me tell you about my, my life with Prince. So in the early 80s or early mid 80s was when he became in top 40. And Sunday night, I listened to Rick D's top 40 mm-hmm. countdown. Mm-hmm. And it would start at like eight o'clock and I would listen to it well into the night. And, it, and I would lay in bed in the dark just listening to my crappy clock radio <laughs> and listen to top 40. And I remember Prince starting to uh you know rise in the charts and uh, charts and i it was um dearly, dearly beloved we are gathered here today for this thing called life right and i remember that song and i just remember being very kind of confused about the song because it's his music is sort of chaotic in, in mm-hmm. some ways and i remember and i and i, and I was you know in my suburban issaquah environment this whole like beat you know, preamble of him being at a, like a, a black minister was a little confusing to me mm-hmm. as well. But that's when I first remember him. And then I actually, uh, I worked at a Chinese restaurant because I'm Asian and my sister worked there <laughs> and called Sun Sun in downtown Issaquah. And while Prince was shooting the movie Purple Rain, mm-hmm. He, which takes place in Minnesota, he actually filmed part of it in in Issaquah, and he went to Sun Sun. He went to the restaurant. While I was you were there. I wasn't there. My oh sister, my, my sister was there. <gasps> oh my god! And he came in, and it, you know, he came in with his girlfriend at the time. Wasn't he with someone six, Nikki Six or something? <laughs> what was her name? Anyway, so that was the big talk. But I remember at the time, like. People didn't really, people didn't really know who he was. You know, it was like to my sister, it was a big deal because she knew him kind of. But to other people in the restaurant, they're like, "Oh, who is that guy?" So then I remember, you know, kind of liking his music, 1999, this kind of stuff. But then around a world, around the world in a day came out in 1985, and that's with. Um, uh, that that's a song with Raspberry Beret, and I had it on vinyl, and it's sort of like his psychedelic Beatles type of album. It has Paisley Park. It has the song Tambourine, which is my favorite Prince song of all time. America, Pop Life. This this album I was obsessed with, particularly the song Tambourine. If you get a chance to listen to Tambourine by Prince, you should listen to it. It's I can imagine it's not very appealing to a lot of people, but to me in my 14-year-old ears, it was just like mind-blowing, mm-hmm. the, the style of it, the way it drives. And again, I'm pretty sure he's playing all the instruments on that, the bass, the, the drums, everything there. What was your life like as a child growing up with Prince? You're younger, so do you remember? F- yeah, I mean, time? I always laugh about um, kind of my upbringing. I, I like to say that uh, it's it's very telling that I learned about Radiohead from the Clueless soundtrack. Oh, yeah. You know, because yeah. I was very mainstream, very suburban. Whatever was on the radio was like what I knew. And then in high school was kind of opened up more through a particular group of friends, which includes my now boyfriend, who is like a musical encyclopedia in his brain. Um, to Radiohead, to uh, who else? Uh, Nirvana, just different styles of music, you know. Um, mostly, I remember, you know, 1999 because I graduated high school in 2000. So, of course, we were like very excited to use that song. And, you know, in 1985, I was three years old. So, I kind of, and it was the same thing when Bowie died, where it was like, shit, like, you know, I kind of missed a big era of music. And I was mad in the 90s about what our music was. I was like, people in the 60s get like Janis Joplin and the Beatles. I have Britney Spears and NSYNC. That's the voice. These are the voices of my generation, which like, I didn't really know at that time how to dig a little deeper and find better music. You know, I didn't have KXP. I was in Florida. And so I mostly learned more about Prince through my friends who knew a lot about music. And I remember my one friend uh, who was a musician just talking about this show he went to and just being like, you know, just watching Prince walk around the stage and picking up all the different instruments and just like killing it on everything. Yeah. Um, I also, you know, 
about his basketball game with, uh, you know. <laughs> oh, no, I don't know that. What's no, that? No, it's the, it's the skit with... Um, oh, with what's-his-face. Charlie yeah. Murphy. Yeah. So funny. Yeah. Well, in high school, Prince was... When I was in high school in the 80s, Prince was kind of considered to be subversive mm-hmm. at the time. He, he was he was very sexual in the 80s, you mm-hmm. know. When doves cry, he's he's you know writhing around it's gorgeous it's a with, gorgeous song with with no clothes on and his chest hair out mm-hmm. and, you know and he's that. just like just all that stuff and i remember when doves cry when it came out when i was 13 or something because i was it was the big the heyday of mtv and we have to attribute some of his fame to mtv because mm-hmm. he, he took to mtv so well i remember feeling like when doves cry was such a strange song to me as i as i got older i i actually love that song it's it's a great i know some people hate that song. i love the version i love that song and i love the version um in that romeo and juliet movie where oh, yeah. a chorus sings it and it's like yeah so gorgeous yeah that whole that whole soundtrack actually with leonardo oh is yeah it was so good way into, i mean that came out when i was like 17 it was yeah, was everything to me I got chills just thinking about that <laughs> that soundtrack. I used to listen to the soundtrack all the time. Yeah, that's so funny. Me too. <laughs> uh, Radiohead's on that album. One of my favorite radio. In fact, oh, probably yeah. my favorite Radiohead song is it. on that album. And then yeah. in, in 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 dances, high school dances in my in Issaquah High School, our high, which is near Seattle, our high school dances were actually attended by people people would actually go like in some high schools they'll tell me like oh no one went to the dances oh yeah but everyone went to the dances and the song of the night was always darling nikki which was on the album purple rain how does that one go um i I can't really sing it but it's very sexual i think it there's a line like masturbating with a magazine or something Mm. and it's just it's a slow hit you know i don't know it's just a very sexual song and i remember everyone who was cool would go up to the dj and this is back you know when you actually had djs that actually put on songs Mm -hmm. like you go to like if there's a dj now which just really bothers me i have to say i don't recognize a single song they play Mm -hmm. or they'll play like a snippet from a song that I recognize and I'll be like, Oh my God, I love this song. And then it'll transition into some long, you know, house jam of some kind that I don't understand. Mm-hmm. Anyway, this is back when DJs would, would had records one and they would just play a song. And at the end of the song, they would mix in the next song on another vinyl. Anyway, darling Nikki. Uh, so all the cool kids <laughs> would go <laughs> To the DJ and go, you got to play "Darling Nikki." You got to and and I remember it was it was like trying to get one over on the teacher chaperones because they didn't know the song was naughty, mm-hmm. and so we were trying to get the DJ to play. It. And then when it, when they played it, everyone just went crazy because you know we thought we were being naughty. I guess <laughs> probably weren't. Anyway, um, I just found it. the the woman's name was Apollonia. Remember her. I think she died actually this this or she died recently too. Um, she was in that that other band. Uh, when no no she's still alive. So in my research, I've discovered that Prince did thirty nine albums. Thirty nine albums. It's insane. Yeah, and I have to say, so the, a downside to Prince was that he released thirty nine albums, <laughs> and he he seemed to he was so. There were certain songs of his that, like Tambourine, that I thought were amazing. But then there's this whole swath of, of songs that I just, I didn't like at all. But I think, so there's this principle that the the number one indicating factor of whether someone creates, quote, a work of genius is how many creations they make. Like Picasso painted 30,000 paintings. You know, so I think that he was such a true artist in that way that he was just creating music, creating music. And it's not that everything has to be great. You know, it's I think it's that process of experimentation and going through so many works where you come to those amazing classic, like iconic pieces. You know, I don't I don't I'm not someone who thinks that like you have to like everyone's or like like every piece of work from an artist often, you know. For example, Ray LaMontagne's uh, Trouble will always be like all up in my heart and soul. 
Yeah. Real, Do you real like deep. All of his other albums. But though? his newer stuff is like, you know, I mean, he. You don't want to stay the same. You want to keep growing or going in a certain direction, and it's a little bit more toward another kind of music that's not my favorite. But like, I'll still keep playing Jolene every day, you know, and um, the the cover is it a cover song, Jolene? I don't believe it's a cover. No, so. it's not. Um, it's not the uh, Dolly uh, Parton Jolene. Oh, okay. It's so good. That's a great song. Yeah. Um, and to me, it's funny because uh, lyrics are so important to me. And I had you, the f- opening lines of Jolene are uh, cocaine flame in my br- bloodstream, sold my coat when I hit Spokane, <laughs> bought myself a hard pack of cigarettes in the early morning rain. And it's just like, oh my God, like poetry, you know? I wonder and if he actually went to Spokane. Maybe. Spokane. I always say Spokane. Spokane. Yeah. It looks Well, he might have said Spokane because it rhymes <laughs> with cocaine. Yeah. Um, but it's like, I don't know the there is that thing from an artist that touches you and whether it's 0.01% of their output, it still matters. You know, it doesn't totally. have to be like, I listen to all 39 albums of Prince's music because he's like a musician's musician, totally. you know, and I'm not a musician, even though I, I, I love music, but I'm not like you, like where you, I can't pick up that guitar and play anything, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. The only reason why I point it out is because there are some artists, rarely, that I actually love, ev- love, love everything they, mm-hmm. they do. Elliot Smith, every song he recorded prior to him dying, because they had, they had post posthumous albums that are terrible, but everything he did while he was alive, I love. The Strokes, they, they've had several albums. I, I love everything they've done, uh, even some of the solo stuff that they've done. The Beatles, every Beatles song, Love it. Uh, lots of the solo stuff I love. So there's just some artists that I just love, and, and I sort of – Led Zeppelin to some extent, even though I don't really listen to him that often. It's hard to find a bad Led Zeppelin song. Mm-hmm. Whereas with Prince, I just feel like he he threw a lot of darts at the dartboard, if you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying. Um, also, then in college, there was this store in the university district called Cellophane Square. Mm-hmm. And they would sell records, you know, cellophane square of a record. And back in the day, they, they didn't sell any CDs. So this would have been like 89, 90. It was just records. And, peop- and as CDs were coming out in the 80s, people started dumping all of their records. Mm-hmm. And so at cellophane square, you could buy old records for like 25 cents. And as a, as a poor college student, looking and you know this is again for those of you that are young there was a time before the internet when you could not listen to a song unless it came on the radio randomly or you possessed it yourself and you had you know you had to buy it and so and as a lover of music i was always just trying to buy more vinyl and at cellophane square you could get vinyl for 25 cents and one of the records i got for 25 cents was Dirty Mind by Prince. And I thought, oh, it's a Prince album that was from a long time ago, like around 1980. I wonder if it's any good. I bring it home and it has uh, While You Were Mine on it. And you got to listen to this song too. I wish I had the Spotify set up so we could actually listen. But While You Were Mine by uh, Prince uh, in college, I listened to that song obsessively and it actually influenced my songwriting at the time. I actually have a song where I'm totally ripping off while you were mine by, by Prince. Because there was a time when Prince was very, this, in around 1980, Prince was very stripped down. He just had, you know, he was just in a studio with studio musicians, you know, just a drummer, him on guitar. His guitar playing was very subtle. His singing was very, it was very poppy. It was very rocky. It was very alt, alt you, you might even say it was sort of alt rock to some extent, you know, just very simple. Uh, mid 80s he started getting bigger with his sound with keyboards and electronic drums and all this kind of stuff but uh it's a it's a really great song it's making me think of like what about like when tom york dies how sad i'll be yeah yeah or paul mccartney for that matter who who else has died in 2016 it, i just know there's there's a bunch of yeah. people natalie cole david bowie alan rickman glenn fry glenn fry he's huge you probably don't remember Glenn Fire. He was from the Eagles. A lot of people. Oh, Vanity. So Vanity was the one who died from Prince. So Prince. Pr- another thing we should say is Prince created many artists. Sheila E. was 
his drummer, I think, mm. Vanity. Uh, there was a lot of uh, artists that he created. Harper Lee, To Kill a Mock- Mockingbird. What? She, she died this year. Oh, yeah. yeah. I thought you meant like she created her. Uh, I want to read what uh, Rachel Kessler, a Seattle writer, put on Facebook. She grew up in a very Christian environment. Uh, and she said, Prince's Purple Rain was smuggled to me on cassette tape in the eighth grade and changed my life forever. It was one of the first secular tapes to go inside my Walkman. I would lock myself in the bathroom, put my headphones on, press play, and dance to it until my family begged to be allowed in to use the toilet. Thank you, Prince, for your magic and power for blowing all our minds in the 1980s and forevermore. <laughs> I think about this with... um with my nephew who's like 13 and you know, when you come into kind of like, I mean, 13 is definitely young adulthood. It's like, okay, welcome to the world. You know, you're kind of becoming an adult and there's been all this rush of like music and movies and art before you. It was like in high school where guys would be like, you've never seen the Godfather. And I'm like, okay, it came out, you know, years before I was born. At what point do you like sit someone down and say, like I was thinking about this summer, to be like, okay, let's listen to the 100 best albums. You know, like, okay, here is Led Zeppelin. Here is whatever. But then also you're kind of experiencing it out of context. Right. You know, you can't you can't really understand how subversive Madonna was in the 80s because right. now everything is so sexualized that it's like, I mean, Madonna in the 80s, like nothing compared to Nicki Minaj, Anaconda. Right. Exactly. There's a lot of things like that, like the movie Citizen Kane, for instance. If you if you watch that, have you seen Citizen Kane? I haven't seen it yet. But well, if you watch it, it it'll, you'll you'll wonder if you're like many people, including me, why it's so revered. You're just mm-hmm. like it's just an old timey movie, mm-hmm. but you had to have been there to know that film. There was film before Citizen Kane and film after Citizen Kane, mm-hmm. and Citizen Kane completely changed the. film completely changed film into an art form mm-hmm. prior to that it was it was you know in the dark ages to some extent but anyway and i i kind of like how all of art is this one big it's like one big thing that everyone kind of moves along a little further and further you know you don't like you said you totally ripped off prints when you were starting that's what young artists do you know you take what's existing you're not you don't come to art in a vacuum you know which is kind of a cool thing about the community of art and how everyone kind of you know there's the impressionists and there are these groups that come out of a certain space and time in an art form and so everyone who plays music now was probably affected by prints in some way ways they might not even understand you know so it's totally losing prints is like losing a part of something totally he he's been a huge force in our culture the batman soundtrack Mm -hmm. uh the what was it peaches and cream album get off and then when he changed his name to a symbol Mm -hmm. (laughs) remember that the artist formerly known as prince and then he becomes super christian and he stops singing all of his naughty songs. Did you know that that happened? I did not know that happened. Oh, yeah. He became super Christian. And he built Paisley Park, this compound. And he would invite people in and and the stories of orgies and stuff. Also, other people who died in 2016. George Martin, as I said, uh, from the Beatles. Keith Emerson of, of Emerson, Lake, and Palm, Palmer. Frank Sinatra Jr. So, you know, we're only a third of the way through this year and there's all these people. Um, there's a lot of other names here that I don't recognize. Someone from a tribe called quest. Yeah. Uh, Maria Semple, who's a novelist in Seattle and like a total badass. She's married to George Meyer, who was one of the main writers of the Simpsons posted a picture of a, uh, white drawstring bag with a gold symbol, like the Prince symbol on it. And all these very old M&Ms that are crumbling. They look like archaeological find. And it says, a party favor from a party we went to at Prince's house in L.A. Whoa. Very Maria Semple. Uh, purple M&Ms. And she says in quote, we all have our problems. Some are big, some are small. Soon all our problems will be taken by the cross. R.I.P. Patty Duke. I don't know. You probably don't know who Patty Duke is, but I was obsessed with uh, the Patty Duke show reruns when I was a kid. Merle Haggard, 
So it's a lot of people, and there's a lot more people, but it just seems like a lot of celebrity deaths. I mean, when you talk about Prince and David Bowie dying in the same, you know, few months, that's crazy. Yeah. And he was only 57. And I think he, you know, the the rumor was, was that Prince lived a healthy life. Mm -hmm. Like he was one of the only 80s, 90s celebrity huge guy who didn't snort, you know, his money. Yeah. And it was said how respectable that was. And so it just seems really surprising that he would die so young. I, I'm sure there'll be an investigation and all sorts of tabloids about this for the next... Oh, I can't... God, I really... I'm not looking forward to that. I'm not looking forward to the, to the tabloids because, you know, Prince will attract... When Alan Rickman dies, it doesn't attract all the tabloids, right? Yeah. But now to be like sex crazed, blah, 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 or uh-huh. I don't know. It'll be some kind of weird yeah. kind of thing. The good news is you can mostly just ignore that. Yeah. The album 1999 was 82, which is so long ago. Yeah, that's so funny. I mean, that's the year I was born. Purple Rain was in 84. Around the World in a Day was 85. Parade was 86. Sign O the Times, 87. Love Sexy, that was an album. You know, do you remember the Columbia... CD clubs. Yes. Okay. Like those kinds of clubs. Well, I remember that again in college, since I couldn't afford anything, I would sign up with as many of those CD clubs and then bag out of the agreement as soon as oh, they, yeah. as soon as they sent me like eight CDs. Yeah. Well, one of the CDs I got was love sexy by Prince in college. And this is a great album too, because it has alphabet street on it, which I love that song a lot. Um, let's see. Batman. Graffiti Bridge, Diamonds and Pearls. Oh, what was that? What did I say? Peaches and Cream? <laughs> I meant Diamonds and Pearls. Uh, and then he just has all these albums after that that it's just like, I didn't even know he was still making albums. Uh, he, he had two albums last year. Oh, he had Phase 1 and Hit and Run, Phase 1, Hit and Run, Phase 2 last year. He had two albums and he had four albums in the last two years. Four albums. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um. What are some other songs that, that uh, I can say that he did? I Want to Be Your Lover, um, I Feel For You, Purple Rain, Let's Go Let's go Crazy. That's the one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Wind Does Cry, I Would Die For You. I would die for you. I would yeah. die for you. And actually, I, I remember he was the first person that started using numbers f- for... Four, you know, like the song I Would Die For You is I Would Die, the number four, and the letter U, mm-hmm. you know? I, and now, like, you see that, it's sort of cheesy, but and a lot of hip-hop artists did that in the 90s. Well, I remember Prince was the first person I had seen do that in the 80s and thinking, ooh, how clever. <laughs> he was working on a memoir. Really? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, this has been a rambly episode about Prince. Normally, when we do tribute episodes, I have more notes and we could talk more organizingly about an artist. What can I say about the psychology of Prince? What he offered to our culture? I would say multiculturalism because he was of of indeterminate race, right? Which I always enjoyed as as a biracial person myself. He brought a very interesting element to top 40 and to to pop culture. You couldn't really pinpoint what Prince was. He brought a interesting queer gender identity similar to Bowie to our culture. He brought, I think, a lot of joy to people's lives. His music was, oh, the song Kiss. I should mention the song Kiss, right? You know, his songs had a certain celebratory nature to them often. And some of his songs had a lot of sadness in them. He brought a lot of positive things. I mean, I'm trying to think of a negative thing he brought to our culture, and I can't really think of anything negative. He was a positive person, I think. Yeah. And I think, you know, for someone who works in the arts, for some reason, trying to work, trying to be an artist can feel really selfish. And then when you see how people mourn certain artists. It's like, oh yeah, like artists do bring something to the world or give something that people want and need. I'm wondering what people will say about him 
now that because you just dropped your almost dropped your phone. Well, that does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle. Paulette's falling apart, so I better end this episode. <laughs> Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself and uh, let's go crazy. I'm gonna listen to Prince on my way to work. Let's go crazy because you're worth it. Actually, let's end the podcast with the song that I ripped off from Prince when I was a sophomore at the University of Washington at the age of 19. Let's 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 end with that. Don't conform the to you.